So welcome everyone to the Association for Social Economics webinar podcast series. Throughout the series, we'll explore the profound and multifaceted impact of economics. This podcast series is sponsored by the AAZE, whose mission is to foster research and publication centered on the reciprocal relationship between economics and the broader questions of human dignity, ethical values, and social philosophy. Each month, I get a chance to sit down and interview scholars in the field. I am your host, Iris Booter, and with me today, I have Dr. Odile Mackett, Senior Lecturer at the University of Witzwatersrand School of Governance. Odil has a PhD from the University of the Witz and is an economist by training. Her research interests are related to the division, quality, and definition of both paid and unpaid work, how households and families are structured and formed around these types of work, and how the state interacts with households and the market to reinforce, reinforce the gendered and racial division of work. She has broadly written on social security, poverty, and inequality specifically, as these factors relate to gender inequalities in society. So thanks, Adil, for being here with us today. So before we get started with the more technical questions, um, can you tell us a little more about yourself, your background, and really what motivated you to get into the field of economics? Thank you so much for having me, Iris, and thank you to the ASE. So I am a South African economist by training, as you said. Um, I used to be quite curious um, as a child, so I always thought that I would get into journalism, investigative journalism specifically. But then I thought that journalism would give me a very narrow career path. Um, and so I ended up with international relations. Um, so I ended up majoring in politics and economics. Um, and to be honest, I never found economics particularly exciting. I thought it was something that would be able to give me a job. Um, but I happened to come across heterodox economics during my master's um, studies. And at this time, I was already employed um, as a lecturer. Um, and I suppose, as they say, the, the, the rest is history. You know, that's how I sort of ended up um, being in these, I, I suppose we would call it the fringes of economics. Um, areas where I now um, operate as an economist and researcher mm -hmm. and lecturer, essentially teacher. Yeah. yeah, it's really nice to figure out like like the pathway to economics is not always just like a clear cut one for a lot of people, but we somehow get around that. I like you, I did international trade as my first major. And then I was like, but I'm only liking the econ stuff here. So it's kind of like a pathway, yeah. you know, you somehow get there right so uh perfect so um speaking of heterodox economics my next question is what do you think the key differences are that distinguish social economics from mainstream neoclassical economics so i think i would like have one distinction and that is that economies are made up of people and not just things. Um, I find that in mainstream economics, we focus a lot on things, how things move, how much things cost, um, cost rather who, who has access to things and, and who doesn't. Um, and when we're talking about things, we can put things in a model um, because things don't have brains and they don't think for themselves. But people are unpredictable and they are dynamic beings. So once you shift your thinking from not just the things but also to the people who handle the things and who exercise power over the things um it becomes difficult to just press a button and predict how someone um will behave and so i feel like when we are trading in the language of things um we sort of miss the point of how things really work in reality because things are governed by people um and people have different interests they have different ways of thinking um, about what they want to do with the things they have access to, whether it be money or whether it be time or whether it be like physical resources. Um, and so I would say that's the one thing that distinguishes social economics. It, it brings social society, it brings society into the, into the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And so speaking of social economics, so how do you view the role of social economics in really addressing our, you know, current social challenges and issues. Yeah. So again, people are not rational. 
and they evolve according according to their circumstances. So if we think about a car, a car is the same car today as it was 10 years ago. Um, people evolve based on whatever happens to them in, in what types of circumstances they grow up in. So if you think about um, the economic violence that we call poverty, um, the ways if someone grows up the, in poverty, that has an important implication of how they take decisions on a on a daily basis, right? It essentially creates a scarcity framework for their thinking and their rationalizing, um, which could threaten, for instance, collective decision making. Um, and that's really one of our major issues that we have in contemporary society, right? Is that people are operating within the scarcity framework. And so we cannot find solutions to problems that require collective um thinking and, and decision making and saying, you know what, I'll take less and you take more because that's what we need to get past this issue. It's like everyone is just grabbing whatever they want for themselves. And that is really one of the core tenets of mainstream economics is that things are scarce. Um, and the minute everything becomes scarce, then it means it's, it's winner takes all. Um, and so there are a number of assumptions within mainstream economic thinking which sort of creates this framework that oh, not only creates new problems but also means that existing problems become like perpetual so we can't find maybe we do have solutions to them but we can't bring them to fruition or make them a reality because it's a winner takes all everything mm -hmm. is scarce essentially yeah absolutely um so we already talked a little bit about your background and your introduction, but we also see that your work is really interdisciplinary by nature. So could you discuss in greater detail um, how your work in the economics field really intersects other disciplines and what really motivates you to be involved in this particular area of research? Yeah, um, so I suppose I could use my my PhD as an example. Um, so I focused on decent work um, as a measure of quality of work. So basically the, ILA's, the ILO's framework. Um, and they basically include elements not only from economics in thinking about quality of work, but also from sociology um, and psychology, for instance. Um, and I think Political science is also quite important um, to the study of economics in general, um, you know, as it's about the study of power and having access to resources can give you power. Now we're going back to economics again, right? Um, in fact, I actually think it should be legal for people to study politics and economics separately in general. Um, but my work also relates to um, development studies, and there are also elements of spatial disparities, you know, which may be of interest to geographers. So I feel like a lot of people, actually, a lot of economists do work that touch on other disciplines. Um, sometimes we just don't explicitly um, state it that, that way. But I feel like if you start unpacking whatever you're doing, um, you'll find that, you know, you're touching on different parts. Sometimes even the methodology, you know, you might be using a methodology that's used by anthropologists. Mm -hmm. um, so it sort of seems like just in terms of the types of problems we study in economics, you inevitably are going to sort of bleed into the work of other disciplines. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, so now we're going to take a little deeper dive into your research and highlight a few of your many published articles. Um, for our listeners and our viewers, we are going to link these articles in our show notes. Um, so in one of your articles titled Measuring Economic Activity in Africa, Time Over Money Approach Includes Women and Unemployed Youth, which was published in New Agenda, you concentrate on the importance of time use as an alternative measure to GDP. So before we dive into this article, could you briefly discuss what time use is and the importance of including the concept of time use in economic analyses? Yeah, um, absolutely. So time use, one of my favorite things. Um, so time use is basically how we spend our time. Um, so again, moving away from just thinking about things in the economy, but also people in the, the economy, is how people divide their time and thinking about time as an important resource. So often we sort of think about time as something that is Free, um, when actually it's not and there are a lot of um, economic theories that actually use time use as a basis 
for explaining why things happen the way they do. Human capital theory, for instance, is one of those. Um, and so in terms of thinking about it in relation to economic analyses, um, it's just about shifting from thinking about it as something that is free of charge to, to everyone to use and abuse, but it's something that is actually a resource that is scarce. And the scarcity is the 24-hour limit that each of us have on our days. Absolutely. And it's um, time use is also one of my favorite things, as you know. Um, but it's also crazy to think that, I mean, the, the concept of time use has been around, but really the data collection on it is pretty recent, which is just, to me, kind of crazy to think about, right? Um, yeah. So diving a little more, right, this leads us into the really important discussion of economic activity and economic well-being and what, generally speaking, defines that. So while we know that the concept of GDP has been around for over a century, right, one of the limitations is that it does not include aspects such as unpaid care work. So could you tell us a bit about the difference differences between using GDP to measure economic activity and using time use data. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when we think about GDP, GDP basically includes things that we can count. Um, and the, the reason we can count things is because they've entered into a process of exchange, right? So maybe you've gone to the shop and you've paid for a loaf of bread. The amount that you paid basically tells us this is how much this thing is worth so the problem with unpaid work by definition it's not being paid for so the process of exchange doesn't happen and therefore we don't know how much is it actually worth um and so the thing with unpaid work is now we don't have a value for it um so even though we can um value labor paid labor because your your paycheck would tell you how much your your labor is worth um, or the loaf of bread, you know, the price to now, we don't exchange um, the unpaid labor that is exchanged essentially. Um, did I answer that question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, okay. Perfect. <laughs> yes. But, the, um, but one of the issues, right, or to add on to that, it's not an issue, but rather unpaid care work, right, is a fundamental aspect of the economy. Um, and typically undervalued and thus, you know, not included in GDP. So, um, and um, another research area that you have concentrated on is the area of social security. And that we have exemplified by your publication on social grants as a tool for poverty reduction in South Africa, a longitudinal analysis using the NIDS survey, which was published in the African Studies Quarterly. So can you explain the role of government in South Africa in particular in providing social protection? Mm, so um, just to give you a sense of um, South Africa social security program. So along with countries like Brazil, South Africa basically has one of the most extensive social security programs in the global South. And this is mainly characterized by cash transfers. So cash transfers are provided to vulnerable groups. These mean people um, who are elderly, um, so children whose parents um, meet a means test, and then also people with disabilities. So essentially, these are people who are not expected to work. Um, and then we also have social security, which is linked to labor market activity, right? So we have private pensions, and then we have an unemployment insurance fund, um, along with a, a, a number of other things. The problem, though, is that we have a very high unemployment rate. And so the underlying assumption in the design of the program is you're either too vulnerable to work or you have a job. And if you're somewhere in between, you're basically not covered. And that is basically the, the crux of what essentially sort of undermines the objectives of the, the social security program. And that's what I discuss a bit um, in that article. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. And then how does your work in the area of social security fit in with your research regarding labor and unpaid labor? Yeah. So um, basically this, this article sort of highlights that gap, right? Is that people who are unemployed, 
and who have never worked in their lives because now they haven't accumulated a pension, nor do they have credits with the unemployment insurance fund, would basically be left out in the cold. And that has important implications for households and their formation and the way how resources are shared within the household. So basically an unemployed person logically cannot sustain their own household, right? They need to pay for rates, taxes, rent, et cetera, et cetera. So what's the logical thing to do is to move into a household where you will be covered somehow by existing resources within that household. And that might be households who are recipients of the cash transfer program, or it might be households where there are other employed individuals who might be, I suppose, willing to share their resources. Um, but what this also does is because the household composition changes, the amount of work that needs to take place within that household also changes, right? So if there are more children, it means there's more work. If there are more mouths to feed, there's more food to be cooked, there's more food to be bought. Um, so a lot of this is, a lot of these activities actually is, are captured in, um, in what we would call that unpaid labor that is now not enumerated so it is actually invisible um, to any statistics we have on the economy unless of course we are doing a time use survey mm -hmm. bringing again the importance of time use surveys um, to light. That's that's wonderful thank you um, and so back to the economics discipline a little bit um, Micro and macroeconomics are often really detached as really separate entities or areas of inquiry within the field. So how do the arguments that you make in this particular article challenge us to overcome that dichotomy? Um, yeah, so it really sort of shows what happens when a change or a decision is made at the macro level and how that translates to the micro level, which would be the household. So for instance, um, at the beginning of the budget cycle, when we decide how much we are going to allocate to each program and who's gonna be excluded from those benefits and who's not gonna be um, excluded, this has a direct bearing on what happens in the household. So I made the example of um, unemployed people who basically now have to rely on private households because they cannot procure those services from the market. They don't have money to do so, nor can they get them from the state because the programs of the state don't cover them. Um, there's this one statement that Professor Lynn or Somme made one day on a webinar that I always quote, um, and she says that, you know, the reason why people are not lying in the street and dying of hunger is because somebody is taking care of those people. So who are those people who are doing the caretaking? Um, and so when governments do stuff like defunding certain programs like healthcare or social security programs or important early education um, childhood development programs, for instance, the household needs to fill those gaps, especially poorer households where um, those services cannot be procured from the market. And so it's actually just part of the same ecosystem, really. Um, and sort of to think of these things as two separate pots of discussions can be very counterproductive to actually finding solutions that um, have a bearing on how people live their lives day to day, um, as opposed to just thinking about how do we split 100 million rand or dollars to make sure that you know, everything is spent is what does this allow people to do and what types of decisions does it induce them to make on a daily basis? And that's really what economics should be about, right? When we think about economics, not just as things, but also as people. Yeah, absolutely. And so we've seen that from our brief discussion here, that your research spans different themes, including work and labor, time use, so security and development, but a, a unifying thread seems to be gender in your work. So why is a focus on women and the youth also necessary when talking about time use? Um, yeah, so I think women is fairly obvious, right? Women tend to be because of gendered social norms and their access to um, resources that help them to procure market services. Um, they tend to do care work in the household whether it be paid care work or unpaid care work. So naturally, when we talk about time use and unpaid labor and inequalities, women tend to sort of be at the forefront. 
the reason why I include the youth um, in that particular article is because in South Africa, the youth unemployment or the unemployment problem rather is disproportionately a problem of youth unemployment. Mm -hmm. um, so if I remember correctly now, um, if you take the, the, the last labor force survey um, data from the last quarter and you basically take the expanded rate, it's almost like um, three out of four youths are unemployed. So the higher the age bracket, the smaller that proportion becomes. So it's essentially a lot of youth that are unemployed in the economy. This means, first of all, that they probably have no labor market experience, which means they won't have access to those social security benefits, nor do they have social security, um, social protection um, coverage from the government. Um, but I include them also because people often do stuff with their time. So just because you are unemployed doesn't mean you are unproductive. Um, and thinking about unemployment or employment in the way it's currently designed leads us to sort of make value judgments about what constitutes productivity. So there are many youths, youths, I will call them youths. There are many youths who are, for instance, um, engaging in survivalist activities, you know, maybe they engaged in subsistence activities, maybe they're helping somewhat in those households they now form a part of, maybe they're providing some unpaid childcare that allows someone else to go to work and be productive, right? Um, and so I think when we have a debate about time use in the context of a country like South Africa or Brazil um, that has a large unemployment problem and a small um, informal sector in our case, um, we need to rethink our notion of what is work. Um, and once we get a sense of how people spend their time, we might change our minds about what we consider work because people are literally not just sitting at home on their bums watching TV all day. Um, people are actually doing stuff with their time that contributes to the economy, but we can't see those things because we're not enumerating them. Yes, absolutely. Um, so jumping into your work with the ASE. So you currently serve as the international director on the executive council for the ASE. So can you tell us a little bit how you got involved within the ASE? Yeah, absolutely. So I think I came across it by accident. I can't remember where, <laughs> but I did join the the um the association um a while ago. Um, but then I got approached by the the selection committee to serve as one of the international directors. I believe there are two. Um, and so yeah, that's what mm -hmm. I currently do there. And yes, I, I serve on the um the executive committee um of the association mm -hmm. in that capacity. And so what does your current role, for those who may not know, as international director mm. entail? Yeah, so I'm sort of still fairly newish. So I'm still trying to figure out the, the infrastructure of how the, the committees work. Um, but I do find that with a lot of these associations um, that I'm now forming a part of, that it's sort of very like American, right? There's a lot of American academics, not necessarily just American academics, but also academics from elsewhere in the world who are um, based in America. And so a lot of the ways in which these associations are designed and the activities are designed sort of reflects that. Um, and so this is just something new that I'm coming to learn um, mm -hmm. in, in recent months. But I think that the um, the roles of the, the various directors, because you also have the, the other representatives within America, so the Easterns and the, I don't know what you call all of them. The regional. The, people. Mm -hmm. the regional, there you go. Um, so their role would entail basically going to these generic um, conferences that you have, right? And then representing the AEC within those. So elsewhere in the world, we don't necessarily have these genetic conferences. So in South Africa, for instance, we have the Economic Society of South Africa, they have their own conference. So I wouldn't necessarily come and bring the ASE to that conference. So I actually think as a lot of these organizations expand to include academics from other countries, there's an opportunity to rethink um, what these roles are. And so I'm in the process of of rethinking, you know, what this role is outside of just serving on the executive committee um, and perhaps making a few uh, suggestions, you know, to just 
I suppose tweak it. Um, perhaps, perhaps what 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 my suggestions will be will be complete rubbish. Um, but I think it's 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 sort of worth a worth a try. But I do think there is definitely a need for promoting um the ASE um in other countries mm. around the world and sort of having at least um American focused, if I can mm-hmm. call it that. It sounds yeah. like it's a bad thing. It's not. Um, but yeah, that's basically no, that's... where I am at this point. I was going to say, it's a really interesting take, right? Something that we may not know. I mean, I, I'm in America right now, so, um, but we may not know that we don't have, like, other countries don't have this type of approach or this type of, you know, the the conferences, the regional things, right? Like, all those aspects. So, I think, I mean, I'm a proponent of change, so change is good. So, um, yeah, (laughs) I would say bring your insights, (laughs) because that's why you're on the board, right? That's why you are on the executive council, is that... We want um, individuals' feedback. So, um, yeah, that's amazing. Then, um, similarly, did your involvement with the ASC or partly because you were, you know, I mean, you're already interlinked, right? I mean, there's a reason why you joined the mm-hmm. ASC, right? It's probably because your research already tendencies are towards that. But did your involvement have an impact on your approach to economics or your research focus? Um, yeah, so I, I was already sort of doing research related to that. And also I was working with people who already um, formed part of the association before before I joined it. Um, but it's sort of nice to just have like a reinforcement of the work that I do as valid. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's nice to kind of find your community within the broader scope of economics. So, Absolutely. Um, so can can you discuss how an understanding of social economics contributes to a more inclusive and equitable understanding of economic behaviors? And do you bring this type of discussion into your classroom? Yeah, so um again, I really try to bring home the notion of people. All of us are part of the economy, so we have different interests and challenges. Um, and I basically bring in arguments in my classroom around topical issues, um, such as like land reform or social grants. You know, these topics can be very divisive, um, specifically in, in the political space. Um, so people often see like the economic side to the problem, right? So if it's about social grants, which is also part of our social security system, it's about how much is this costing us, you know? Um, whereas if you see the people within it, it's actually a small price to pay you know to to help people the same thing goes with land reform land is a productive resource um so if only certain people have access to land what does that mean for the way people are able to live their lives you know to also um build i suppose i don't want to say generational wealth because it seems like generational wealth might be a bad thing but like generational security right people don't necessarily want to be wealthy they want to be secure and they want to know that their children are going to be secure they're not going to leave their children in poverty or whatever um and so basically being in a multidisciplinary space helps me to bring in these different topics rather than sort of teaching the basic um economic models you know that we all that we all have to teach um and so basically the point is that we are not accountants, right? So we we are social science. We don't just look at the value of money, but we also look at the value of people and what type of lives do these policies and the things we spend on allow them to live. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, part of this webinar podcast series is really highlighting researchers and their work. Um, so how can listeners find you or follow your research or read more of your works? Yeah, so, I mean, everything's sort of on my website. It's just odealmaca.com. I have a few links to articles, and I also have links to uh, my other social media profiles on there. Okay, perfect. And we will put that link in our show notes as well. And so last, um, I always end these podcasts with this question. Um, I really want to end with looking forward. So what do you envision the future of social economic looks like? Yeah, so um, I suppose I would say that it needs to be brought to the mainstream. It would be good if 
you know, you walk into an economics class and whatever we talk about is in social economics is taught on the first day. It's not like the first day we first laying out the assumptions and the theories of mainstream economics, which is often what, what, what we need to do, right? Um, and I suppose it needs to be a more viable option for students of economics um, and heterodox courses in general. So it's a pity that like a vast majority of institutions don't have like heterodox economics institutionalized. You know, it's something that you you come across if you if you're lucky enough in your life to have Idas in your lecture as your lecturer. You know, she might by accident introduce you to it, and that's often what happens um, with areas of economics such as social economics. Um, and this is especially true on the African continent, where most of our degree programs are are sort of mainstream programs, you know, it's sort of programs that help people get into government and into the bank and, and, and. Um, the really sad part of that is that, especially the government people, is that they actually at the sort of cold front of policy making. Um, so if you have the sort of mainstream um, training, it's difficult to then get a sense of why what we're doing doesn't work. It's because the people are missing from mm -hmm. what you've learned. Um, and I suppose it's also difficult to bring into our teaching as heterodox economies, economists because there are so many different strands of how we can think differently about economics. But it seems like we almost don't have an entry point that allows us to bypass mainstream economics. So it's difficult to, for instance, talk about how the law of demand might be rubbish, if I'm not saying that it necessarily is. Um, I don't study the law of demand, but it's difficult to say, it's to sort of undermine the principles of that law if you haven't explained the law. And so it's sort of like a, a chicken and egg situation. No, it's difficult to explain how demand and supply goes together, um, you know, without presenting it in the scarcity framework, which might not necessarily be the case for all types of resources um, in the economy. And so I think this is where, you know, the pedagogy people become really important and the work that they are currently doing, um, because I believe that they sort of finding those entry points of, you know, if you're teaching an economics 101, you know, years away that you can do it differently, or if you're doing a, a, an, a graduate level course, um, and all your students come straight from mainstream, you know, years away of perhaps introducing something different to them and making it palatable and, and convincing. Um, and so also the ways in which we, we introduce these ideas to students um, is as important as the ideas themselves. And so, yeah, that's it. That's fascinating. So I want to thank you for being here with us today for a fascinating discussion. Um, and I hope people check out your website. Thank you so much for the invitation. I really enjoyed chatting to you. Thank you.